I'm so nervous. Hey everyone and welcome back to another Coffee Talk podcast episode. Today I am so excited to bring you an interview. Today I'm interviewing one of my favorite authors, Atticus. Atticus writes some of the most amazing poetry. You've probably heard of him before. He's got a couple books out like LVOE or Love Her Wild, The Dark Between Stars, The Truth About Magic. Atticus is an anonymous poet who rose to fame through keeping his identity secret while sharing his art through social media and through writing and through books. And come to find out, he's actually Canadian. I always thought he was American because he lives in LA now. He actually is a fellow Canadian, which is really good to know. So he's gained a massive following. He's published several books. He's very popular. He's very successful, and I'm very excited to be talking with him today. He's about to tune on in about a minute or two, and he doesn't take very many interviews, being that he's anonymous. So I feel nervous. <laughs> I can't tell, but I definitely I'm very honored to be able to have this spot. I'm so excited to talk poetry, to talk life, to just talk all things. So let's dive in to our conversation with Atticus. Hello. Are you able to hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. How are you? Good. How are you? Oh, I'm great. Yeah, it's a nice sunny day here in Austin. So good day. Oh, nice. I always thought you were based out of LA for some reason. You know what I was for a long time? I was in uh, Venice, but um, okay. yeah, now I'm, in, now I'm in Austin. I love it. Where about you? I live pretty close to Ottawa in Canada. I used to live in Toronto, but just moved out here just after the pandemic, and I'm also loving the change. Oh, amazing. I, I love Ottawa. I went to school in Montreal and used to come visit, uh, visit often. Yeah, I actually found out through doing just a little bit of research before our chat that you're Canadian. I never knew that. Yeah, I'm Canadian. I, I, I think I'll, not a lot of people know that because, uh, you know, like you said, I'm often down in LA and post about that. But um, yeah, Canadian, Vancouver. West Coast. Do you ever come back often? Um, I do come back a lot. I'm, I'm coming back. Uh, I like, obviously, the summers in Canada are amazing. Um, yeah. And my family all lives in BC uh, on Vancouver Island. And so I come back and then take a boat up to Desolation Sound and uh, Gulf Island is my happy place. Yeah, the summers here are definitely where it's at. It's the six months of winter that, I mean, in Vancouver, it's not as bad, but definitely here in Ottawa. And if you were in Montreal, you know what it's like. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. It. I know it very well. But God, the summers in, in that area, like Muskoka and all that is just awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on to my Coffee Talk podcast. I like I'm, I'm a little nervous. I have to be honest, just because I've been such a fan of yours for so many years. Like, no I, way. If I, if I knew a couple of years ago that I'd be sitting here having this interview, I feel like I would just be over the moon. So I really appreciate you coming on. And You're so being, sweet. Thank you. <laughs> being that my, my podcast is meant to feel like, like you're sitting and having coffee with a friend. So I do have to ask as my first question, if you were to walk into a cafe or when you do walk into a cafe, what's your go-to coffee, drink order, whatever it is? It's a good question. And like, I don't know if you know this, but I started my own coffee company yeah. called Poet. Yeah. So I'm like, um, I'm obsessed, obsessed with coffee. And I think coffee is a key reason that I, I'm a poet and able to, <laughs> to write poetry. I rely on it heavily. So right now, my go to drink is is a cold brew with uh, like an alternative milk, usually oat milk or coconut milk. Okay, no sweeteners, just straight, just straight oat milk. No, or... straight. Yeah, okay. I, I feel like uh, the, the milk gives it a little like, uh, you know, je ne sais quoi. What about you? Definitely coffee. I try to get into tea, you know, if it's past 3 p.m. Iced coffee in the summer, hot coffee in the winter, but I always have to have my first cup hot for sure. Yeah, I know what you mean. I mean, it's just that kind of ritual. I'm jumping ahead of myself here, but I did no, please, have dude. questions about like your you starting a, a coffee brand. Like, what was that about? We'll get into the poetry, obviously, but I have to know... <laughs> Like, what was that journey? Like, what led you into creating a, a coffee brand? And obviously the name, like naming it Poet was just like chef's kiss. So what was that journey like? <laughs> Not very creative. I think all my things are called Poet. It, it's interesting. And it kind of goes back to when I was writing my very first book, Love Her Wild. And I was on this journey to really explore what it was to be a poet. And I, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to move to Paris, rent a, a tiny little attic apartment. And uh, I'm going to write this book. And that's what I did. And every day I would go down and go to like a different coffee shop. And the experience was just amazing. I mean, I'm sure. Have you been to Paris? Yes, I have. It's beautiful. 
I would go often to these coffee shops and I, the experience was just incredible. They just do coffee so well. What I realized was that like the coffee that I was drinking was was far superior. And when I came back to the States and like kept trying to write, I was like, just this stuff isn't hitting the same for whatever reason. And it's like, I don't know if it's the water or if it's like the quality of the beans or like how they prepare it. But like Paris coffee was far superior in my opinion than what I was getting in the States. And so as a creative, like I'm sure you're kind of similar. It's like we kind of rely on that bump of energy to get inspiration, at least at least I do. And so yeah. Having like continuously bad coffee can actually really affect your work. As I went along, I was like, I want to create the same coffee experience that I got in, in France here so I can drink it. So it, it actually like stemmed from me just wanting to have a higher quality cup of coffee. And I teamed up with this company called Bellwether, which is is the first in the world, some of the first in the world to do all electric, zero emission coffee. And... Um, they helped me source these beans from all over South America, but like, like largely Guatemala, of all these women-owned farms, um, wow. and like yeah, and create this zero emission all electric coffee. And I won't take any of the credit for the for like the roast that they ended up coming up with because it's just their talent at Bellwether. But what they came up with, I thought was just incredible, and and just you know my favorite cup of coffee in the world right now. Um, right. You know, to answer your question, I, I I often now make cold brew out of my poet coffee. Um, okay. That's, that's my go-to. Yeah. I was, was going to ask that. Yeah, that would be amazing. I'm super intrigued what you think of it, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll send you some. I'm sure it'll beat Tim Hortons out. No question. <laughs> <laughs> I um, miss Tim Hortons though. <laughs> I mean, yeah, but I can see that taking a good break from Timmy's, you would want some of that. You mentioned, so if you sit down and you have a crappy cup of coffee, you feel like you don't make as good of art. What is your ritual around creation? Like, do you get strikes of inspiration? Do you have like a ritual? Do you have to have a cup of coffee? Are there times of the day or do you just kind of go with the flow? Like, I'm really curious to know how your art comes from the internal and how you pull it out into the external. Yeah. And it's a great question. So it's kind of evolved over the years. I, I started, when I started writing, it was very much really trying to get into the moments around me around in life. And what I mean by that is like at a party, I would write a poem, uh, mm -hmm. like walking down the street in a place like in Europe or something, I would write a poem and it would just be like sparks of ideas. And I just kind of jot them down. And it, and it was before I started sharing them, there was no structure to it really. It was kind of just like, if something inspired me, I'd write as I kind of evolved, I'd start writing at night primarily. I had this like little writing shack on, in the back of my um, property in, in Venice Beach. And I filled it full of everything that I found um, inspiring to me, to me, you know, like my typewriter and, and like all my favorite books um, and authors and poets, you know, incense, candles, like er everything that I felt like inspired me. And, and I would just go back there and bring the typewriter out and just write. I, I found that very, very powerful for me. You know, I found it very, very inspirational. And again, as I evolved, um, I had to become a little bit more systematic at it because I had to create more poetry. And so right. these days, as, it, as it's more of like, um, um, as I do more and more books, my move is to honestly get up in the morning, have a swim, and then have a cup of coffee and start writing. You know, I don't like to to mess around too much before I just get right into it because I want like maximum energy and maximum um, inspiration, really. And I and I write for as long as I can, and and uh, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, and sometimes I mean having that routine or that ritual works, and other times you might like. Do you find that you still sometimes get those those like sparks of inspiration where you're you're in the living and then it comes back to you again, kind of like in the beginning or? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I still, um, I tend to just jot it down in my phone and I have like, a, you know, a notes um, on my Apple or my, like I have an iPhone and so I just yep. use the notes and I, that's where I jot most of my poems down. It could be just like a seed of an idea or a spark of an idea. And then I kind of flush them out, try to flush them out later. Right. And you've changed it from, so you used to write at night in Venice and now you write during the morning in Austin. Do different yeah. places pull out different routines or is it just kind of like, it's just whatever uh, flows, whatever it's flows a good goes. Question. I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, it flows goes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I think it's just kind of changed to my, 
to fit my lifestyle a little better. Yeah, that makes sense. You've obviously built a huge following on media platforms like Instagram. And I know a bit of like the story behind what led you to opening your art and just your whole world to everybody else under the alias of Atticus. But for anybody else listening, do you mind talking about your journey about how you first got started sharing your work online and why you go under the alias of Atticus? Yeah, of course. Um, so years back, I'm, I mean, I, I certainly never set out to become a poet. I, you know, I, I didn't have it anywhere in my head to be, you know, to write poetry and, um, you know, you as a Canadian, me as a Canadian, um, you know that that like poetry is not something that's necessarily encouraged to the men of Canada, which is like I think a shame. And being vulnerable is not, not something that I think is encouraged to, to Canadians, specifically men. And so it just wasn't on my radar at all. But I always loved reading the classics. I loved like huge fan of Kerouac and um, always a fan, like a fan of Byron and, and Poe and um, Hemingway and like Hunter S. Thompson. You know, these were the books that I love, but I never thought I had, had anything uh, myself to say. And then um, I went to, on this trip to France, of all places, and I met this actor there named a guy named Michael Madsen, who's the bad guy from Kill Bill and Reservoir Dogs. Really, really incredible guy. And he's been through a lot in his life. And I ended up becoming quite close friends with him. And he, he kind of taught me about his struggles with depression and and how poetry had, uh, in in his words, saved his life. This was super interesting to me. You know, he just put out a book of poetry, and and this was like this like badass American actor, whiskey drinking, motorcycle driving guy had put out a book of poetry, and that was like a real eye opener for me. And it also was like it in in so many ways it gave me permission to explore a more vulnerable side of myself. And so a few days later, I think it was like one of the first times I ever went to Paris. I was just walking down the street and started started writing my own poetry. I brought that back and, and you know, like I said earlier, started typing it on a typewriter. And I was like, oh, you know, Instagram was just coming about. And I was like, you know, it'd be fun to just share this and see if I can meet some other poets and, you know, become friends and just like chat, chat poetry online. I thought it'd be really cool to find a community and. Uh, I never expected it to grow, but it it kind of took off quite quickly. It all just went from there. And I chose to do it anonymously, actually, because at, at around that time, a friend of mine um, who, was, who was in a big television show at the time um, actually passed away accidentally in a, in a hotel room in Vancouver. It was a really hard time. For a lot of us, he was from Vancouver Island, where I'm from. For me, it was like this, uh, it was like complications of fame that that led to to him passing away. And uh, it kind of really shook my world. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to do this as it grew. I'm like, you know, I'm going to stay anonymous. I'm going to just going to see if I can share this work without having the recognition for it. And, it, you know, as definitely an experiment it still is but it was kind of just important to me to do this for the right reasons and and to separate myself from any sort of fame or notoriety and you know i i think looking back now it's it's really helped me you know have have very little ego about this i think it like it helps me write write more vulnerably i think it separates me from from attic you know atticus as a uh personified and um yeah, it's been it's been a wonderful experiment and and journey, and I wouldn't change a thing. Well, first of all, I'm really I'm really sorry about your friend. I, I'm I could totally see how those complications of fame, and especially I think too with where we've seen like social media and media in general, just where it's taken off to in today's world, and wondering where it's going to go even in the next five to ten years. Like there was no way of knowing in 2012 even what things like Instagram were going to turn into. Um, yeah. And it's really interesting how you said too, like you're able to have Atticus personified and then have your entire being in a way it's separate, but they're the same, right? Like, Do you feel you get to turn it off sometimes and just get to go live and like re-inspire yourself? And then you kind of can put like the Atticus hat back on or how does that balance work for you? It's almost exactly what you said there. It's, it's, it's wonderful to just be able to flick a switch, be, be Atticus, but also not. And I think 
atticus de defines like a good portion of me but not all of me and so it's nice to just be able to live different lives that collaborate but they're not you know they're they're separate i think there's there's synergy from that whether you're searching for your latest sneaker drop, that iconic handbag, a timeless watch, or your next piece of classic jewelry, eBay authenticators are there verifying every detail of your purchase. We're talking every inch, stitch, tick, facet, and clasp that make the piece that you're searching for worthy of your collection. eBay authenticators are experts in their craft, true connoisseurs, and as leaders in their fields, they're making sure that your items always arrive as authentic as your style. So go ahead. Treat yourself, get that piece that you've always wanted, and leave it up to the meticulous eyes of the eBay authenticator to make sure that watch movement is original, that glimmer is real gold, that rare sneaker is legit, or that handbag is really made out of genuine leather. And never get faked over again. In a world that can be full of fakes, it is time to get real. With eBay authenticity guarantee, everyone deserves real. Visit ebay.com for terms. Do you ever have any kind of difficulty keeping your identity private? Like, has that ever been an issue for you? Yes and no. I mean, it, it yeah. makes everything like a little bit more, a little bit harder. And and I, I do it out of principle almost. I'm really trying to stay to the world. Like, you don't need fame to have success. You don't need fame to spread spread your words or spread your art or spread your music. It's sometimes hard. It's like you know. I would love to just um, be on this podcast with you, turn on the video and just like have a conversation or like go on when I go into interviews in, in person, like do the same thing. Cause I, I really love right. people and I love interacting with them and, it, and that's the only piece I miss. And then, you know, you have book agents and publicists and things being like, Hey, would you ever consider taking off the mask? You'd sell so many more books and like all, all this. And, you know, for me, it's not, a, not about that. And, you know, I've, I've been lucky enough to be to be um, fairly successful in a, in other worlds. So for me, it's not about money or the necessarily success of Atticus. It's more about the principle. It is tricky and it it is hard. And it you know, if someone finds out who I am, I'm not worried about it at all. And one incredible thing I've I've found personally with my audience is just like a protectiveness, and uh, I think they understand. Like here's a guy who lost a friend. Um, that doesn't want to be famous, but still wants to try to spread goodness in the world. And, um, and so they're kind of protective about it too, which, which I've always appreciated and, and never really expected. Right. Well, I, I think it's interesting too, that people would tell you, I, I don't doubt that if you were to expose like who you are, that it would, it would obviously help you sell books. But I think there's also this sweetness to the fact that you are anonymous because people can read your words and really put themselves in what you're saying or kind of reshape what you've created into something that they feel or that they've experienced. And I, I, this is going to sound so weird that I'm tying it to this, but sometimes I feel like I will find a song or I'll hear like a band that I really love and then I see what they look like or I know who they are. Or I watch the music video and it all changes. It doesn't make it worse by any means. It just like what it's almost like when you read a book and then you see the movie, it's like you create the world in your mind. And I feel like that's an added element of the creativity that you give to people with your art is that you allow people to also kind of create their own vision of the words that you write, which I think is really cool. And, and I mean, you're still like, you're here, you're still doing you're still doing like the personal side of it too, which is really, really cool. I love that you said that because it's actually like one of my favorite parts about the anonymity is that people take the words and they just, they make it, yeah, exactly like you said, they make it whatever they want. And a huge amount of people have gotten the words tattooed and, I, and I've always loved talking to people about like, what's the meaning that you instilled on this when you put it on your body or like, you know, it they, they're taking uh, like a, you know, something simple and they're putting their own like art and meaning in it and mm -hmm. it becomes theirs and it's not mine. And it's like, and I, I think that's a beautiful thing because it's almost like Atticus exists separate, like from me, separate from everybody as just this, uh, like you said, whatever, whatever you need him to be or whatever you need her to be. Yeah. Um, actually, it reminds me of this time. I, I did a talk with a mask and my mask was reflective um it was in new york or something and and after the talk this woman stood up and she said i don't know why you chose 
that mask, but I think it's beautiful that it's reflective because uh, people can see themselves in you. And right. I was like, wow, that's, that'd make a good poem. But it's also, I, I love that. It's it's kind of what art is. It's it doesn't belong to the artist necessarily. It's like it's in the it's in the it's in the perceiver, the balder. Yeah, it's it's interesting too how all of these like choices that you've made just so happen to have like so much depth to them. It seems just so serendipitous, like wearing that mask even and not even realizing it was reflecting back out and it ended up being such a like profound, it had a profound meaning to it. You can put your art out there and regardless of what you read about your books or you read about your art, it's never going to be personal because it's you have that separateness, which I think is really cool. I mean, should you ever decide to embrace and be like, yeah, okay, this is who I am. Obviously, that would be just as cool and unique and interesting because we're all so individual. But I think it's so cool what you're doing and that you've kept it this way. I, I think, again, too, with how enticing the allure of fame and, you know, following and all of that can be. So, I mean, major kudos to you for sticking it through. And I know you said you kind of do it on the principle, but to me, it sounds like the underlying energy is just very much that you you're trying to send home a message not just in your poetry but also like in your choices that back up a lot of the art that you share oh thank you very much it's very nice nice of you to say <laughs> and it might look it might look like well uh well planned in in hindsight but you know to your point it was, it was all kind of serendipitous and accidental and have you heard that quote uh well jim carrey's got one he's like i hope everyone can become rich and famous uh, to realize that's not uh, that's not what it's about. Yeah. And then Bill Murray's got one that's kind of similar. And he, he's like, if you want to become rich and famous, become rich first and then see if you still want to become famous. Uh, mm. Is the line. It's kind of a mistakenness in this generation. Um, there's kind of an obsession with with fame. And, you know, with with TikTok and, and, and reels and all this. And on one side, you know, fame um, and recognition can be so, so powerful and can do so much good and can bring, you know, economies and industry and um, wealth and power. Uh, but at the same time, you know, there is this dark side. And, and I, I think it's just kind of uh, weighing those pros and cons and, and just being doing everything, you know, doing these things for the right reason. Right. I think too, like there's like a level of responsibility when you do gain a certain level of notoriety, which is interesting too, because you have, while still keeping your identity anonymous, but you, I feel like you do handle that responsibility well. Like you, like you just said, you, you're really trying to hit this message home to people. And I do agree too. I mean, definitely not on as large of a scale, but even just getting a little taste of what it's like to be so validated by other people, I can see how addicting it can get. The levels we're seeing it go to in today's world too, with things like TikTok and stuff, it's like people will go to such extremes just to go viral like once. And it is, yeah. I think if everybody did get a chance to have that, to see what their choices would be, I feel like it is very, it's very interesting to see how people use it for good and how people can get stuck in not necessarily using it bad intentionally, but I think it's just like you get stuck in the parts of yourself that might be like unhealed. So people try and fill those voids with so whether it is fame or money. You brought up some really good quotes, but I'm curious now bringing it back to poetry. You mentioned a couple of poets that you were really inspired by and you loved reading. Do you have like favorite poems that obviously aren't yours that come to the top of your mind when you get asked that question? The poem's name is called A Poem Amory Sent to Eleanor and which he called Summer Storm. It's like faint winds and a song fading and leaves falling, faint winds and far away a fading laughter and the rain and over the fields a voice calling. There's, it goes on, but it, it, F. Scott is one of my, maybe, maybe my favorite um, writer and just like the cadence of his work. I don't know if you had to read Great Gatsby uh, yeah. in, in school, but if you get a chance, reread it and just like sit with some of the sentences that he um, that he shares uh, in in all of his work. But it's so lyrical and it's so beautiful and, and thoughtful. And it's almost like he could have been a musician and, uh, you know, in a different life. Uh, right. But yeah. F. Scott Fitzgerald is 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 wonderful. I love Mary, Mary Oliver. She's a. She's a, you know, obviously a huge poet who just passed away, but her, she's got a lot of beautiful nature poetry. Mm. Um, Margaret Atwood um, is an, is another one, um, and I got lucky enough to read with her on 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 CBC Radio actually. Oh, that's recently. amazing. And she's 
Canadian. Do you have a favorite experience from writing a certain poem or writing a certain book that just felt so aligned, like you were fully in the flow and it all just came together? Do you have any experiences like that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, when my little sister was getting married, she asked me to kind of be ordain the, the marriage and um, asked me to write a write a poem. And so that that's actually in that first book, Lover Wild. It's called My Fate. And it's, it's basically around about how for her, love was not a choice. It's her fate. You know, it, it's like she she never it. That's how powerful it feels. And so I've always loved that poem. And then um, there's another one, I think, in in the end of the third book, maybe about a little girl who uh, and her father and they travel in the car to uh, a grave. And she steals stamps out of the drawer and she goes to a grave and, and asks uh, her dad, like, how many stamps to get to heaven? And her dad says two. And it, it alludes that she, she's obviously writing uh, a letter to her mom and she she stole the stamps. And I wrote that after um, a, a friend lost her parents. And you kind of draw on what you see and what you know and what you observe. Um, and so... Yeah, th those are kind of the, the poems that stick with me the most. When you either hear stories or like empathize with other people or go through experiences yourself, does writing help you like process these types of experiences? I mean, it obviously sounds like it does, but I'm curious your answer. Yeah, absolutely. I always say like some thoughts are better down on paper and it's, it's true. It's like the same reason we journal. It's the same reason we talk to a friend. It's the same reason. It's kind of like you release it. Right. Instead of holding it within um, too tightly, it, we release it. And, and that's what poetry has been to me. And it's also helped me as a boy, as a man, like become more vulnerable and, and like say the things that I think a lot of, you know, men are, are encouraged to keep inside, you know, um, particularly in my relationships. And I'm still better at writing them than I am at like at saying them. It's just kind of this is kind of my my love language. I definitely understand that. It's sometimes too, it's just like you can get, you can get what you really mean out in words sometimes a lot easier than when you're just trying to pull straight from the brain out the mouth. A lot of your poems too, they, they center around love. And so I'm curious to know, like, how, how would you define love in your experience so far? Oh, that's a good, that's a good it's question. A deep question. <laughs> yeah, I know it is. It is. And, and my definition for me of love has, has changed uh, a lot over the years. And I, you know, I think if you've read my poetry, you, you'll notice yeah. that I, I write a lot about young, young love um, and that first love. And I think we've all kind of experienced that, like holding, a, you know, another's hand for first time or like that, that first kiss ever. And like, you know, that young love that you, you know, in your heart will last forever, it, you know, and the purity of that. And I, I love writing about that that kind of love. I also love writing about the old love where it's like losing someone after 60 years together. And what does that, what does that feel like for me? You know, love has transitioned and um, has become a lot, I think healthier in my, in my older age. And, and, you know, it's really built on things like uh, trust and, and companionship and, and kind of spark and um, vulnerability. I think it's like one of the great, and I'm just about to release this new book and I have a quote about vulnerability. We, we realized like way later in life, uh, this is my opinion, but um, that vulnerability is the path to true love. And it's like giving yourself, giving pieces of yourself to someone else is really where you build that trust and, and commitment and deep love that we kind of talk about as true love. Um, right you know, it comes so much to that vulnerability. And, and I think that particularly for me in my in like early relationships, like no vulnerability at any, any cost, I had to protect myself, you know, from getting hurt and put up these walls and, 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 you know, it was less about trust and more about fear and excitement. Um, and so, so it's, it's really changed over the years. And what I thought was love was, was just, you said it earlier, just kind of trying to uh, fill in pieces of yourself, right? You were looking for the wrong mm -hmm. things. A, a big piece of my journey is realizing that like, you don't get into a relationship to find someone to fill the pieces of you you're, you're missing. It's like you come into a relationship as whole as you can possibly be 
and show up as that whole person to another whole person as you know and be two whole people together and encourage each other to be whole if that makes sense did you write a lot about this kind of love in the book that you're releasing yeah lvoe is um the one i just released and then lvoe2 is the one i'm about to release and both these books are kind of exciting for me because um they're less about that that darkness and the struggle and kind of you know uh exciting but scary love and in th- these ones are more about the the love we've been, we've been talking about and i think people will find it really hopeful and positive and it, it, they were just more fun writing come from like a way brighter brighter place and i think it reflects on where i am in my life yeah because i mean those earlier like first loves that we all have like they set you on fire and it's definitely like an adventure fire, yeah. and it's fun but it hurts but then you find those loves hopefully later on in your life that start to feel more like like coming home. And so it's cool too that, I mean, obviously as you've evolved, your writings evolved and like even your books evolved with you too. So that if someone were to read your first book and then read along all the way through to like LVOE part two, like they're going to also almost in a way be able to see that evolution itself too, of like discovering or unfolding the different layers and the different kinds of love, which is really, really cool. I have to ask only because your your assistant brought it up and this is such a crossover for me. So I've heard that you once went on a date with Taylor Swift, a little bit of a diehard Swifty over here. I need to know what you're able to tell me. <laughs> I can tell you, uh, tell you everything. She's, she's like, one, one thing, Taylor's just an incredible person and she's like the real deal. We, we had lots of friends of friends and I went on a, on a date with her and we've, we've chatted, um, a lot over the years but I went on a date with her after after the video music awards in in LA um, many many years ago uh, we were both kind of kids looking back at it but it was it was just it was exciting you know she's 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 awesome and I think um, as a Canadian I think she's got a very similar like irreverent like goofy sarcastic humor which I'm sure as a super fan you pick up on yeah but that's like the real deal that's like who she who she is and right. in any of the interactions I've had with her at all and it is very like minimal she's she's a wonderful person and very very um uh, pure and, and I think that's that's the main reason she's been so successful is because she's not lying about any of this stuff you know right um she's just telling the truth and I think I think that's like with Atticus is kind of what I've always tried to do. It's like, you can say whatever you, people can like it or not. And, but I'm like, I'm out, I'm out here trying to tell the truth. So, yeah. you know, and I think if you tell the truth, people can, you know, it doesn't matter if they like it or not. It's like, this is just my truth. It was like, how can you tell me what, what is my truth and not? So anyways, yeah, it, it was wonderful. She's, she's awesome. She, she's, uh, she's super fun and, and cool. So so you're a huge Taylor Taylor fan? Oh yeah, I've been a I've been a Swifty for like since Teardrops and My Guitar. It's been a, it's been a long journey <laughs> there as well. So when I heard that, I was like, I was trying so hard. I was like, I'm not gonna go there. I'm not gonna go there. But I just had to. It sounds like you have a lot of really like cool friends in the industry. And so I'm curious, do you have any other mediums that you use to express yourself without like giving? I don't know if you. I don't know exactly what they would be or if this would give anything away, but like, do you have other other art forms that you like to use to, you know, put your, put your expressions and your vulnerabilities out to the world? Yeah, it's a really good question. I haven't been asked that before. I, um, I used to make a lot of like videos, um, I, you know, spread my art in videos, you know, I, I don't have, not necessarily, like, I, I wish I could say like, I'm a, I'm a great uh, musician or, you know, a great sculptor, but uh, I'm not. And a lot of my creativity comes within, um, like, uh, in business, um, okay. like product, you know, coming up with, with products or companies and, and things like that. I think, you know, Poet Coffee was a good example of a really fun um, creative outlet. You know, the, the Poet Wine Company was just the same thing. And like a lot of the stuff we make in the merchandise or are just like new expressions of like, how can you weave poetry into, into these different um, industries? That's been really fun. And I announced it recently, but it's coming out pretty soon. I have this uh, journal that I'm, that I'm really excited about called Spark. 
and it's a one sentence journal and it, it it's been a really cr- fun creative journey because um i'm someone who's who's like a lot of us out there have like have just struggled with ups and downs in my life you know depression anxiety and and you know call it whatever you want but mm-hmm. i i think more common these days and um it was largely in my youth i i think youth's a pretty scary time for for a lot of us um but you know what I, one thing i did back there was i took out a journal and um i used to write like one sentence anytime something good happened i'd write a sentence it was just like a a little spark of an i of an idea just being like you know went sailing with this person so fun like you know whatever and i i just write what i found is i i just like filled up these entire journals and i'd find myself going back to them especially when i was like down and i'd reread okay. these journals and each one of them would spark this incredible memory um, that I probably would have forgotten. And what I found was I just read through them and it was just like these sparks of kind of serotonin, dopamine, you know, positivity. And I found it was such a powerful tool um, for in mental health and just like happiness. And I found that journal um, a few years ago and I was like, God, I want to recreate this for other people. Um, and so we worked on it for a few years and, and are finally releasing it. But like, I hope, I hope anybody or like somebody or, uh, you know, lots of people, I hope they find this as a really useful tool. Like I found it. So correct me if I'm wrong. You write like a sentence a day that encapsulates like what your day was. Yeah. It's not even that. It's, it's like, uh, it's close to that. It's, it's, it's spark one sentence journal and there's prompts throughout it. But like a lot of it is just like like list a spark here. So anytime, like, um, you know, went on coffee talk and had like such a good, good chat. Um, and it just like, it's just a kind of like a positive memory. Like went to France and (laughs) drank wine with, you know, these people just like, just enough, um, just enough of a spark to, to, uh, ignite that memory. And it doesn't need to be every day doesn't need to be every week, but every time you can think of, you know, you could, a couple of weeks could go by and then you could just load it full of 10, 20. Um, but like really curating those positive memories and I'll, I'll send you one of those too. And uh, Please I'd love do. to see what you think. Cause um, totally. I've always done this like journaling session around this thing called bliss points, which is just like you, it's a oh, you cool. just pull out the bliss points of your day or your week. So I love that you're calling it spark. And I feel like even even better that there's the prompts there too, because I think sometimes when we get locked in our thinking or like, if you've had a bad week, you're just in a weird, weird energy, like to have those prompts to be like, okay, like what, what was your spark of the day? Like anything along those lines, it definitely can help pull forward the things or the sparks of like our days or our weeks or whatever it is. And like you said, it's cool that you said going back and rereading it and revisiting those memories was like a serotonin boost for you because it's so true too. Like we again tend to forget we have such tunnel vision even when we look backwards or or even think about the future and then when we remind ourselves about where we actually were during those times and what our words were straight from those moments it is such a serotonin boost so that's such a cool concept and idea and I think that actually is super super artistic in terms of the ways of expressing yourself but doing it through like you said like business or like products but things that still align with who you are and and pulling the poetry through it is so cool. And I would definitely love a chance to get uh, both your poet coffee and one of those journals. If <laughs> I'll I can. Send, uh, I'm going to send you a little package. I, okay, yeah. please do. Um, yeah, no, I mean, it, it's all that stuff. It, it, it just, um, it's just fun and it's really pure. I, I never do things um, just to, to do them in at my age. Like I'm just, um, I, I do things that inspire me. And so, you know, this I felt was really important and I wanted, wanted to do it. And I got a cool partnership with, uh, do a more diamonds. I bought it, bought into this wedding engagement ring company called do a more. And, um, they're the most ethical diamond company in the world and they make beautiful stuff. And it's like all non-conflict and they do like largely lab diamond and uh, it just made sense to me. It's it was like yeah. I all I talk about is love and poetry and and yeah. people use this stuff for weddings. And I'm like, let's let's do something fun in, in jewelry, just as an example of I just love putting creativity into that where I can and one of my final like questions for you was what's coming up for you in the future. And I feel like you did 
you mentioned a few things here, but, and I know I can, I definitely can empathize with how odd it can feel sometimes to have people just like throwing compliments your way. But I do think it's really cool that you set such an example being that again, you don't have to do things ethically. You don't have to pull through like your values and the choices that you make and the things that you create. But even hearing that you're choosing to do, I mean, the coffee roast, obviously, but also to like the diamonds, like you're doing it all ethically and there's nothing like your face in your name. I mean, your aliases, but it's not tied to it. So I think that that's so cool that you not only create the art, but you also stand behind like the ethics behind it. You practice what you preach, which I think is really cool. Very nice of you. <laughs> um, I'll choose my other question then to end with, which is uh, when it comes to like your following or your readers, or I mean, even anyone listening today, what do you hope fe- people will take away from your work, the things you create, your poetry? Like, what do you, what kind of larger conversations do you want people to make around things like love, relationships, and self discovery? Yeah, that's that's a wonderful question. I mean, I I think it's a variety of things, and at the at its very core, like I hope somebody could pick up a book uh, or see a poem on Instagram or something, and just feel like a little bit better about than they did before. You know, that's like Atticus at its simplest core. I can do that a couple times. I've succeeded. I think on a, on like a bigger scope and 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 scale, I want to bring more poetry in, into the world. I want to encourage um, um, men and guys, and um, you know, I, I say men and guys, but it's just like the masculine or like you know, I just encourage people to to be more vulnerable yeah. um, and to express themselves because um, I, I think so many people don't, and then I really encourage people to, if they want to become famous, to really think about, you know, why am I doing this? Am I filling something that's, that's missing from somewhere else that fame will not fill? Or am I doing this because I, I want to be a, a face for, for good and change? You know, all, all of these things I think are kind of my mission and I'm very imperfect at all of them, but you know, you just try, you just try, you know, try to try, try your hardest to, to do these things. So. Very nice yeah. to say those things. So thank you very much. Of course. Well, I can tell you for sure that it translates through, I mean, the screen, through all the things you do create. And then uh, without giving like, again, I never want to breach your privacy, but I'm also just curious if I have time for one more question, like yeah, of just course. yourself as a soul moving through the world, like what's next for you personally? Good question. I think my next adventure is is like a family, like having some some kids and I think that they're going to open up a lot of poetry, I would imagine. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure they will. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm very excited. Like, very excited about that. Uh, oh, that's can so I turn exciting. it around? What about you? I, I mean, I actually just had a, a baby myself back in September. So wow, right now congrats. it's just, I've, I'm just learning how to balance it all now. But I can definitely... I cannot wait for Atticus parent poetry, just like even just in general, <laughs> the, the love, the level of love, the evolution of love. Like I'm so excited to hear it through your own words afterwards. Cause I definitely feel like it unlocked like a whole new depth of love for me as well. So I just, that, oh. that's so cool. I can't wait to read all about it through your words. It'll be amazing. I'm sure. Thank you. And I'm, I'm very excited. Um, I'm very excited about it. it. It makes me think of that. Like Ryan Reynolds has a very funny, funny quote, but about like his love for his wife um, and how powerful that was until he had with his daughter. And he's like, and he's like, how that just changed everything. He was like, I would use her as a human shield. <laughs> yes. Period. Exactly. Have you heard that? It was, it's like, yes. he does it. I mean, it sounds insane out of context, but Ryan Reynolds does it in that Ryan, he just loves his family so much. Yeah, a hundred percent. Also yeah. Blake and, and Ryan, like their humor towards each other is hilarious, but yeah, oh my I, God. I feel like it's, I, I gathered all the ask. context. I would do yeah. the same with my partner for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, their, their relationship is amazing. What, do you have a boy or a girl? A uh, little boy. Oh yeah. man, congrats. And he's so the cool. best. He is the best. I, I I'm I put headphones on so I wouldn't get too distracted. I'm sure he's been babbling <laughs> in the background this whole time. Oh. I would, wouldn't be able to tell you. But yeah, it's the best. And I I hope I like I, I hope it's everything for you. I and I can't I genuinely cannot wait to read how your poetry will evolve again when that happens. So oh, th- 
thank you thank you so much for coming on and having this conversation this just like made my whole year like like oh, oh. i had my son last year so i'm allowed to say that so this is <laughs> my whole year i i've been such a fan of yours for so many years i think i picked up your first book back in i want to say it was 2018 and since then wow I'm, yeah, That's crazy. been I such love a that. big fan. So this just this was amazing for me. I loved the opportunity to get to chat with you, and I think everything you're doing is amazing. So thank you so much for coming oh, on my podcast. It's my absolute my pleasure, and I really enjoyed chatting with you. So thank you. What a cool human! I love that he keeps his identity secret. I just love everything that he does. That he layers it with all of his values underneath. I feel like he does. I've said this a million times in this chat already, but I feel like he sets such a good example of what it is to share your art share your vulnerability i love that he mentioned even just like sharing vulnerably from the space of being a man and from the masculine like mm, just so many good nuggets of wisdom in that conversation i can finally breathe because i was so nervous but like such a great conversation such a great person definitely check out more of atticus i will leave both his coffee his books all of the things down below check out his new journal coming out too like i definitely can't wait to get my hands on that and yeah that was just like that made my life i can't believe that i just i just talked to one of my favorite poets i'm gonna go do some downward dog and a couple deep breaths and i will talk to all of you guys in the next coffee talk podcast episode if there's anybody else that you would love to see come on the podcast and have a nice coffee conversation with me definitely be sure to let me know and outside of that i'm choosing you all the rest of my cup which is it just turned itself into a cold brew that's all although i feel like atticus would tell me that this is probably shit coffee for writing now but that's fine it's fine i'm still gonna drink it and i will talk to all of you guys in my next episode Bye.